Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes? All right. Um, I'm Ellen Levy, Chair of the Great Decisions Committee and a board member of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. Welcome to the last lecture in this year's series. How many council members do we have for the last lecture? Okay, quite a few. Great. And how many are students taking the course for credit or not for credit? Okay, great. Um, how many of you have attended uh, a lecture before tonight with us? Wonderful. Okay. If you're not a member, you've heard this drill before, please um, sign up for email reminders of our upcoming events. But consider joining. It's also our last night, and we still have the Great Decisions Guides, one night only, $12, the night you've been waiting for, in the lobby after the talk. And also, please fill out the ballot inside your programs for this evening. We'd like to thank our evening sponsor tonight, Grand Valley State University. A fact, Russia will figure into our discussion this evening on the Caucasus. The current U.S. Ambassador to Russia, John Byerly, is a graduate of GVSU. And thank you to our media sponsor, Michigan Radio. So I've made a mad dash through the housekeeping details so I can get to this part. This is our last lecture in this Great Decision series, so I have thank yous. Will the professors here who teach Great Decisions or give extra credit for coming please stand? Thank you. Will Adam and Kaylin please stand if they're in the room? There they are in the back. You, they've done a fantastic job of running around with the mics to help with question and answers at the end of our series, uh, end of our sessions. Thank you. Now, who has been here at, to at least seven lectures this year? Raise your hand. Great. Thank you to all of you. Many of you have been loyal Great Decisions audience members for years. We really appreciate it. Now to our final topic of the series. This will be an extensive presentation with PowerPoint. So if you can't see too well from where you are, please move up. As you will see, the Caucasus region is the most linguistically and culturally diverse region on Earth with over 50 ethnic groups. And I know that Dr. Davis will talk about oil in the region, something we are all most surely interested in now with what has been happening in the Middle East. Please help me welcome Dr. Sue Davis, formerly of Grand Valley State University and now of Denison University. All right, well, welcome to everyone. It sounds like we have a really engaged audience here tonight. I mean, a whole huge number of people raised their hand. They've been here seven times or more this season. There are only nine in the series, right? That, that's impressive. That shows a lot of commitment. Well, today we're going to talk about the Caucasus. This is one of my favorite regions of the world. It's, um, as, as Ellen pointed out, very, very diverse. But it's also really interesting um, because it's one of those places where you go where they, they really love you as an American. There really aren't that many places left where you go and you say, I'm an American, and they go, yay! Uh, this is one of those areas. One of those areas where they still really like us, uh, and that's, that's kind of nice. I've been in other parts of the world where, sadly, I have to admit, I have claimed Canadian citizenship <laughs> because it was just safer at the time. Um, but this is one of those regions that really still likes us. So it's, it's fun to come here and to talk about a region of the world that I really love, that really loves us, and talk about our interests in that region. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to do a, kind of a general introduction to the region. So we're going to talk about where this region is, uh, what they do there, what kinds of industries they have, what kind of languages they speak, what religions they have, those kinds of things. Then we're going to look at each country briefly so you have a slightly more in-depth look at what each country, because they're quite different despite the fact that they share a geographical region. And then we're going to come back to the region as a whole and talk about U.S. interests there. So to start, uh, the, the, the Caucasus is divided into North and South. The Northern Caucasus is actually part of the Russian Federation. We're not going to talk much about the part of the Caucasus that's in the Russian Federation. Uh, we can in the question and answer period if you're interested, but for our purposes we're not going to. We're going to spend most of our time on the Southern Caucasus. And that is the three countries that I have listed in alphabetical order, because if you don't list them in alphabetical order, somebody gets mad at you. 
oh, you like the Azeris better, you like the Armenians better, you like the Georgians better. So the three countries are Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, all of which are uh, very small but very diverse ethnically, linguistically, uh, and geographically. These are all post-Soviet states. We're going to talk with that about what that means. They're all very small. Armenia has slightly less than 3 million people officially, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, Georgia has around 4.5 million, and Azerbaijan is the largest with close to 9. Uh, these are all very weakly governed. None of these are true democracies. Uh, it's hard to kind of throw out a, a type. Uh, not being democracies, they of course don't like to be called authoritarian political systems. Some of them are. Uh, we can put an adjective on front of democracy, and we can talk about them as managed democracies, sovereign democracies, electoral democracies. Uh, but we'll talk a little more about each country and where they fit in there. But they do all like to think of themselves as democracies, but don't really fit our definition of that. Uh, and lastly, they're in a very difficult neighborhood. Uh, this is a neighborhood where it's tough. Right? You've got Iran, you've got Turkey, you've got the Central Asian states, you've got Russia. Right? So, so this is a, a very difficult neighborhood. I like maps, so I've thrown in quite a few maps. This right here is a topographical map of the region, and you can see uh, the three states of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. You can see Turkey, Iran is down here south of Nakhichivan, that's the kind of the brown stuff down there, and then Russia to the north. So you get a kind of idea of where they are wedged between the Caspian and the Black Sea. Right? This is an ethnic map of the region. It doesn't really do justice to the diversity of the region. Uh, for example, that big gold blob there that is the Georgian people, the Georgians would claim that that's not an accurate representation of who they are. The Swans, the Mingrelians, uh, the people from Poti, they all think of themselves as ethnically different. They all speak slightly different dialects. And so they perceive themselves to be different, not as an unadulterated mass of gold as it's portrayed on this map. Uh, but you get some idea of the ethnic diversity of the region through, through this map. Now, geography is important. I always thought that if I'd gone to graduate school a couple of years later, I'd be a political geographer because I really do love maps. And I think maps tell us a lot. And knowing something about the geogra ge geographical region is, I think, very, very useful. But they didn't have political geography, or at least where I was going to graduate school, they didn't have political geography. So I became a political scientist. But I do like geography. So it's a very mountainous region. right? When you think about mountains, you think about a lot of different things. right? Mountains make it very difficult to travel. So you tend to have groups that are more isolated. You tend to have more different dialects in, in these very, very tall mountains because in the valleys they can't get to the neighboring areas. So being mountainous is important. And these are big mountains, right? These, these are not the rolling hills of Pennsylvania. These are not the Alleghenies. These are big mountains, right? 18,000 feet. The, the mountain range that divides the Southern Caucasus from the Russian Federation is about 100 miles wide and 680 miles long. Right? So that's a pretty good size distinction. So it kind of gives you a feel for the separation between the North and the South Caucasus. They have a lot of different climate zones. Uh, I was in Azerbaijan most recently in November, and every time you meet Naziri, the first thing they tell you is, every climate zone, we have it. We have everyone in our country. We have desert. We have tropical. We have this. We have that. And they start throwing this at you. And they're very proud of, of the climatic diversity in their country. The Georgians do something similar. Uh, and it matters because it really is dramatically different in different parts of the country, and, and that, that ref that's reflected in their politics. It's also very small. If you go from, I have to go, let me go back to the map. You go from Sakhumi over here, see that, well, Batumi, we can probably take that. From Batumi all the way over to Baku is less than 500 miles, right? That's not very far. If there were a road, which there's not, you could drive it in less than a day. Right, so it's a very small, small region. Um, this is a satellite picture where you can get kind of a feel for the height of these mountains. Right, those white, that, that's the Caucasus mountain range that I talked about there at the top. You can see kind of the flat areas out towards Baku and the Apsaran Peninsula where you've got a very dry, deserty kind of climate. Uh, so you get kind of a feel for it from that. Uh, and then there's a number of different kind of geographical kinds of pictures here that I just think are pretty interesting and show you some of the 
diversity in climate in the, in the region. I like to refer to this whole area as the post-Marxist space, and that's intentional. Uh, the whole idea of PMS is very tension-filled, right? So this is a very tension-filled part of the world, and uh, the post-Soviet just doesn't quite cut it for me, so we're going to call it the, the post-Marxist space. And they're dealing with a number of historical and geographical and political kinds of, of holdovers. Uh, they were authoritarian, very strongly authoritarian, some people claim totalitarian under the Soviets. Uh, because they were lied to for so many generations, uh, they have very little trust in politics, they have very poor work habits. The tradition in the Soviet Union was you pretend to work, we pretend to pay you. This persists and causes all kinds of problems. Because of the legacy of socialism, there's a strong ethic of, of equality. There's this feeling that everyone ought to be equal. And if you're not equal, you've done something wrong. That you, you're probably a thief or a provocateur or you know, some other kind of epithet. And yet, there's this rising inequality which is even dramatically worse in Azerbaijan than it is in some of these other places because of the oil that the Azeris have found in the last uh, couple of decades. The economies are very disjointed. They don't really have much diversification. They don't really have, um, they're not logical because for so many years they were part of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union created an economy whose main purpose was to control, right? was to prevent autonomous action. And so the roads all lead to Moscow, the, the plants all lead to Moscow. If you were making a plane, right, you had to have, you made the uh, avionics outside of Moscow, you made the fuselage in Uzbekistan, you made um, the wings in Azerbaijan, and then you put them all together somewhere. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, nobody could make a whole plane, right? And nobody could make a whole, I mean, they could make a whole shoe, but not much else. And the shoes weren't very good, and they were all like size nine men's left shoes, which wasn't very useful either. So there's all these economic problems that stem from that background as being a Soviet state. There's a lot of problems with Russia, right? If you think about uh, the relationship between the United States and Mexico or the United States and some of the smaller Latin American countries, you get a little closer to what they're experiencing. These are very small places in the shadow of a very large place. Economically, they loom large. Politically, they loom large. Uh, militarily they loom large, and so Russia is part of their everyday uh, thought processes. And for many of the, the people in the Caucasus, it's not a benign presence, it's a malignant one, it's a scary one, right? In addition, there's all these conflicts which we're going to talk about. There are three out-and-out -out wars that have gone on in this region and a few more that haven't quite made it to the level of war, but have been very violent. And there's also dramatically limited media freedom. Right, so again, not really democracies. So to start with the last one first, uh, there's a number of places where they rate media freedom. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Freedom House. It's a pretty good non-governmental organization that looks at uh, media freedom in the world. And they put out a map every year that's interactive. You can click on it on the web and it'll show you that someone's free, partly free or not free. Right? And they explain what that means on the website. These three countries we're talking about today, none of them are fully free. They don't have a media landscape that allows free entry into it or allows you to publish whatever you like on a topic. There's a lot of uh, what they called in Soviet times administrative measures over the media. So there's a lot of control by elites of what goes in the media and what doesn't go in the media. There's a lot of... Um, kind of, I guess control is as good a word as any. Uh, constitutionally, they all look great. Constitutionally, all three countries look like perfect media environments, perfect democracies, but they don't follow through on that. Uh, the government harasses opposition. There's all kinds of, of problems with, with access, particularly in elections. Right? If you look at some election monitoring reports in particular, you'll find some real problems with opposition even being allowed to voice their platform publicly. They're, they're cut off or there's odd um, electronic disturbances that get rid of the electricity for the one hour that your candidate has their free media time and it's just the, the electricity's gone. And they say, I'm sorry, we broadcast you, we're done. We did our bit. Right? So it's things like that. 
Uh, the broadcasting environments are very politicized. They monitor the internet. They monitor and limit access to different websites. And so that's uh, important to recognize. Economically, these are very different places. They're different size economies. Azerbaijan is kind of the, the odd man out because of the oil. So their GDP in, 19, in 2009 was $43 billion. And their growth rate last year was 11%. Oil's starting to come down a little bit, and we'll come back and talk about that. Georgia is about half the economic size of Azerbaijan, and a lot of their economy is from transiting the oil that comes out of Azerbaijan. They also have some really nice wines uh, that you should look into. Uh, and then Armenia is the smallest of the group with only 8.7 billion for GDP. So they're very small, and they've actually been, they've been their, their economy has been getting smaller over the last few years, although this year it's estimated to grow at 4%. Uh, once you've reduced to a certain size, it's kind of hard to reduce anymore. In terms of the major industries in the region, uh, none of them are really full-fledged, diversified economies. So Armenia has a lot of agriculture and food processing. They have excellent brandy uh, and machine tools. You can tell I talk to college-age audiences alike a lot, but, but also alcohol is very important in this region. Uh, you have to talk about the alcohol. I have a really good friend who uh, is actually Czech. And uh, one of the times, I was back in the Czech Republic, before, well, it was still Czechoslovakia in the early 1990s, and I was told that the reason that the Czechs and the Slovaks must get divorced was because they had different alcohol preferences. So to, to many people in this region, that is very important, just like it's important to college students. Uh, in Azerbaijan, primarily oil and gas. This is a very large part of their gross domestic product. Agriculture is also large, and then, of course, petrochemicals. If you have the oil and the gas, you probably make plastics and fertilizers and other kinds of things as well. Georgia is also primarily agricultural. They have some mining. They have quite a few resources for a very small country in terms of mining. Nothing really important. They have some uranium, some molybdenum. I can never pronounce that. Things like that. Uh, they make a lot of wine and alcohol. Uh, they do some steel. They do some machine tools. But in general, not really service-oriented economies in the way we think of it in the, in the modern way. Right? So back to the neighborhood. I want to show kind of a neighborhood map that shows where they are. It's that tiny little Georgia's green, Azerbaijan is red, and Armenia is kind of brown, although in this picture you almost can't tell it's different than Turkey, but it's kind of light. Uh, but you can see where they are. And this is a really problematic neighborhood. right? And you can see where Iran, right here to the south, is a very big, both geographically and politically, in this region. right? Turkey is also very big in the region, and then Russia. But these, we're going to come back and talk about these, these uh, neighborhood issues. So on to each country. First, Armenia. This is the Armenian flag. The Armenians have been around for a very, very long time. Recorded history has them back way before the Common Era. All right? The Armenians have been around for a very long time. One of the things uh, about Armenia is they, they were the, one of the first Christian nations, or the first. Uh, for those political scientists in the room, there really weren't states prior to the Treaty of Westphalia, but the Armenians like to say that they, as a state, adopted Christianity in 301. And what this basically means is the king of Armenia decided he was going to be a Christian and made everyone in his, at that time, domain, not really a country, uh, also become Christian. This is very important to the Armenian sense of themselves. They are very interested in being that outpost of Christianity in what they see as a sea of Islam, just to the south. And then the Azeris are also Islamic, which we'll come back to in a minute. But this Christian heritage is very important to them. And so they, they talk about it constantly. This is the current president of Armenia. is a gentleman named Serge Sarkisian. You'll see it spelled several different ways. Armenia is one of the countries that has its own alphabet. The Armenian alphabet is different than any other alphabet. Uh, it's very ancient, and it's um, unintelligible to us. We would recognize it as an alphabet, but to, to the untrained eye, I have linguist friends who deny this, but uh, it looks a little bit like a Farsi or an Arabic to me. Uh, they say linguistically there's no relationship, but, but just visually and artistically, it's, it's very squiggly language, just like Georgian. Um, Mr. Sarkisian has been, has been in office since 2008, he was elected in the second of two contested elections, and following those elections, there were problems. There were protests, because there was a feeling that these were 
problematic elections. There were some problems with media freedom and medium fairness. Um, things along those lines, the opposition leaders thought they were unfair, and so tens of thousands of people turned out in the streets. They ended up, the government was able to wait out the protests and still rules, but there's a strong undertone. As a matter of fact, just last week, 10,000 people turned out in Yerevan to have a, a demonstration about political freedoms and in favor of the opposition. There is a parliament, has 131 members. Politically, it's not terribly important in the Armenian landscape. The president is more important, right? They have parties. Some of them have been around for quite a while, but they tend to be more based on personality. And this is one of the reasons why I say that although the Armenians would classify themselves as a democracy, there are some serious limitations to that democracy, one of which is that um, they really don't have stable, a stable party system that, that's based on ideology, right? They don't have some, a left and a right. They have, you know, Serge Sarkisian's people and Levanter Petrosian's people, and they're very personalized. And that makes for problems with democracy, right? Makes for problems with democracy because democracy is supposed to be about the rules of the game, not the individuals in those institutions. And this is still very much an individualized uh, kind, of, kind of government. Uh, Another thing that's really important in understanding Armenia is the size of their diaspora. A diaspora is a group of people that has been forced out of their home at some point in history and now lives outside of the homeland. Right? In, the, in the Armenian cases, there's about little fewer than 3 million people in what is now the Republic of Armenia. There are almost 8 million in diaspora. Right? And this, sh this map shows you where they are. The darker the color, the more members of the diaspora there are. There are a lot in Russia. There are a lot in France, there are a lot in the United States, there's some other places where there's a lot of, a lot of uh, the diaspora. But the diaspora is important for a variety of reasons. First, politically, they tend to be more hardline than those living in Armenia. So for example, we're gonna come back after we talk about Azerbaijan and talk about the war between these two states. Uh, and one of the thing, the issue there is a, a place called Nagorno-Karabakh. It is a dominantly Armenian, enclave within the territory of Azerbaijan. They had a war there uh, as the Soviet Union was collapsing. It went into ceasefire in 1994. Uh, but the diaspora is very unwilling to trade land for peace. They're very unwilling to, um, to, to make compromises to get a solution to this problem. Uh, much like in, in Israel and Palestine, the, the, the Jews who live in the United States and in Europe tend to be more hardline on things than those who suffer every day living in Jerusalem or in uh, Tel Aviv. Right? So the diaspora is, is important because they're very involved in the politics back home and they tend to be uh, a little more hardline than the people who continue to live there. Another big issue for Armenia is the genocide of 1915. Right? In the waning days of the Ottoman Empire, for those of you who know much about history, the Ottoman Empire it's kind of the sick man of Europe for the last couple hundred years of its existence. This was what Turkey was before it became a modern secular republic. And in 1915, there were a lot of problems. And among those problems, somewhere between 300,000 and 1 and million Armenians were killed. The Armenians, to the Armenians, this is a cause unlike any other. It's very important that for them that the world recognize this as a genocide, a deliberate killing of their people. For the Turks, the Turks have a couple of claims. One is that you know, we weren't even around yet. That was a different regime, it wasn't us. And the other was, it was a difficult time. Things weren't going well. There was basically civil war. And yes, a lot of Armenians died, and it's a tragedy, but it wasn't a genocide. We didn't mean to do it. So these two sides square off on this issue on a regular basis. And it's, it's an incredibly important issue in the Armenian diaspora. They've now brought it at least three times to the U.S. Congress um, and tried to get the United States to vote as a Congress that what happened in 1915 to the Armenian people was a genocide. Uh, and we've had committees who have voted for it, but so, so far the entire Congress has not endorsed that view because Turkey is a NATO ally. It causes problems for us on a foreign policy front. Under, under George W. Bush, uh, the Armenian lobby managed to get this in front of Congress. It looked like it was going to go their way, and George Bush and Condi Rice pulled out all the stops to prevent it from becoming law because they needed to worry about Turkey. We have bases in Turkey. We have overflight privileges for the wars we're in in Turkey. Turkey is important to us. So we 
kind of downplayed the genocide resolutions as a, as a country and uh, favored Turkey on that point. It seems like we're moving the other way right now. But this is an important issue for the Armenians. This is the memorial to the genocide outside of Yerevan. There are always this number of flowers there. This is something that many, many people make pilgrimages to and not just on the holiday of, or the commemorative day for the, for the genocide. This is very deeply ingrained in the Armenian people. They find this incredibly an important event. Uh, if you go to Colombia in April, the entire month of April, you'll find Armenian communities in downtown New York. They come to Colombia and they protest on the basis of, you must recognize the genocide. You know, look what the Turks have done to our people. And this is a very important issue for them. Uh, this is a church outside of uh, Yerevan. So I've just got some pictures here to kind of give you a flavor for the place. This, is, again, is the capital city of Yerevan with the mountains in the background. Again, at night. Right? And you get these beautiful vistas that are just absolutely gorgeous. These are all very pretty places. This is the Opera House in downtown Yerevan. This is a monastery outside of, of the city. Uh, it's really difficult to get to. You can kind of see the goat track there in the back, for lack of a better word. Uh, it's one of those places where you drive as close as you can, then you kind of have to hike in. Right? I, I've always liked this because it, it really gives you a flavor for how ancient the Armenians perceive themselves to be. This is something that's on some of their money, uh, the Armenian dram, and, and they, they really like to make that tie to what to me looks very Greek, which they claim is Armenian, right? but it's very, very ancient. Right? Azerbaijan is the next country we're going to talk about. Right? And Azerbaijan is a Muslim country, unlike Armenia, which defines itself as Christian, has been Christian since ostensibly 301 AD. Uh, Azerbaijan is a Muslim country, and they are a Shiite Muslim country, primarily, right? much like their brethren to the south in Iran. But they're a very different kind of Shia than those you find in Iran. Right? In Iran, you see a lot of burqas, you see women covered up, you see a very conservative political establishment, Azerbaijan doesn't have that. You occasionally someone, see someone with a hijab, uh, particularly in the rural areas, but Azerbaijan is kind of a post-Soviet swearing drinking variant of Islam. All right, so, so not very uh, uh, devout, shall we say. Although it is rising, it's becoming more important as part of their identity, Islam is becoming much more important. Uh, but like I said, I was just, I was in Baku twice in the last six months. And, and both times I experienced something very odd. The first time I didn't ask about it, the second time I did. We, I, was in a, I was in a taxi and we were driving, I was staying at a place out on the Caspian Sea and I was going into downtown Baku and coming back. And we'd go past this big mosque, the Bibi Hayat Mosque, which is just outside of Baku, and the taxi drivers would always turn their radio way down. And I thought, ah, evidence of a devout Muslim, we do not do this in front of the mosque. I finally asked him, I said, no, it has nothing to do with Islam. It's, 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 a, it's a cemetery. It would be rude to the dead people to play really loud music. It would be disrespectful. It said nothing to do with religion. It had to do with it being a cemetery, which I thought was kind of interesting. So this is a map of Azerbaijan. Uh, it's actually, as Azeri is a Turkic-based language. It is mutually intelligible to Turks, but it is not the same language. So it's, it's different in, in a number of different ways. But you can see that Azerbaijan is oddly shaped. You've got the main body of Azerbaijan, and then you've got this little thing out here called Nakichivan, an exclave. It is, Armenia goes between the two pit bits of Azerbaijan, right? This is one of the many things that Stalin did uh, back in the early parts of the 1920s when he was the Commissar for Nationalities. And actually, uh, I'm not usually a fan of Richard Pipes, but his book on the nationalities question and the founding of the Soviet Union is excellent. Uh, so it's, I think it's called The Founding of the Soviet Union or something like that. But it, it talks a lot about how Stalin deliberately created enclaves and exclaves in order to keep control of people, to create fifth columns inside of what became Soviet socialist republics in order to control them later on. And this is one of those examples. Uh, and one of the things that has been discussed, difficult to say how seriously, is some kind of transfer of territory between Azerbaijan and Armenia so that Azerbaijan could be contiguous, but so that Armenia could control Karabakh. And again, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So Azerbaijan is all about oil and gas. Uh, the, the, some of you may remember the contract of the century that was signed in, in 1995 when BP and Shell and all these Western oil companies went over and there was a big bunch of hoopla about the new discovery 
Uh, right now, about a billion barrels of oil a day come out of the Caspian Sea, come out of Baku, and are, are now shipped via the Baku-Tbilisi-Jehan pipeline, so out the Mediterranean coast of Turkey. It is a Muslim country, about 80% Shia, about 20% Sunni. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Islam has a number of different sects. These are just two of them. The Sunnis tend to be the majority sect within Islam. The primary difference, and I am not a theologian, but one of the main differences is who the rightful leader of the Ummah, the, the Islamic community is. The Shia claim it is Ali and the descendants who are the bloodline of Muhammad, and the Sunnis have a, have a different test for that. Only about 7 to 10 percent of Aziris actually go to mosque on a regular basis. The bars are full, right? It, it's, it's, you go in anybody's home, everybody is drinking, right? This is not, uh, this is not your Iranian-based form of, form of Islam. It's run by the Aliyev family at the moment. Uh, Haidar Aliyev was the, the first president. Well, not the first. There were three or four before him. There were a lot of coups in the early years. Uh, Gadar Aliyev was the first major president uh, of, of Azerbaijan after a, a number of people who didn't last very long. Um, and his son is now in charge. His name's Ilham. I'll show you a picture of him in a moment. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of allegations about uh, what they've bought. And I've just given you one here. This, uh, nine multi-million dollar mansions were purchased in Dubai. All post-Soviets love to go to Dubai. Dubai is where you go to buy everything. So it's a great kind of shopping mall for the post-Soviet space. Uh, and they were purchased in the name of his adolescent son. And so there's, uh, there's been some uh, back and forth about that in terms of charges of corruption, laundering money in the name of your, your son, things like that. Uh, this is Ilham Aliyev and his wife voting, most likely for himself, I would guess. Uh, he's been president since 2003. He was made president shortly before his father died. So this is another one of those cases of kind of almost monarchical secession in the former Soviet space. He heads a party called the New Azerbaijani Party, uh, Yeni Azerbaijan in the local language. There is an assembly, 125 members. It's not terribly important, much like in Ar Armenia. Uh, most of the power in these political systems rests with the president. It's more important to know the president and the president's family than it is to know uh, what political party people belong to. Most people who want to do well in society will join the president's party because that's a good path to, um, to, to wealth. All right? uh, it is technically a, it really, ostensibly it's a one-party state. I mean, opposition parties are allowed, but they're harassed. So you can have other parties, but they're not, they tend not to be very, very successful. You may re remember about a year ago, there were the blogger trials in Azerbaijan. Uh, I don't know how many people remember that, but th there's been a lot of media freedom problems in the last few years in Azerbaijan. Uh, the Wall Street Journal recently came out uh, after the events in Tunisia and then Egypt, and now it seems that not only is Libya on, Syria has been active for, for the last day or so. Uh, so the Wall Street Journal came out with this thing called the Revolting Index. What was the likelihood of a country being the next Tunisia, the next Egypt? And Azerbaijan makes the top 10, right? And they make the top 10, and I've given you kind of a little bit of an indication of, of how they're measuring this. Uh, one is looking at social unfairness. So things like the Gini index, which measures how much gap is there between rich and poor, and is it rising or falling. A corruption index and a human development index. How comfortable are people? How much stuff do they have? People tend to be less willing to revolt when they have a lot of stuff, right? Uh, propensity to revolt, they measure that by looking at median age. The younger you are, the more likely you are to see a revolution or some kind of, of uh, violence. GDP is important. The lower the GDP, the more likely you are to revolt. And then unemployment, right? And, and Azerbaijan rates uh, in favor of revolting on all of these things. And the last one seems to be the kicker, the idea of food costs. Particularly food costs as percentage of your disposable income. And what we've seen the last three weeks in Azerbaijan is people lining up at the Iranian border to go across the border to buy food. Because in Iran, it's still subsidized. And in Azerbaijan, the numbers are going through the roof in terms of the cost of food. Right? So, it's, so, so there's some idea that maybe Azerbaijan is on this list of countries that may revolt in the near future. Right? These are just some pictures of Azerbaijan. This is looking out uh, from the, the beach in Baku out towards the platforms. You can see all the oil platforms from wherever you are on the on the uh, Caspian Sea. This is uh, Bibi Hayat, which is the first oil 
area in Baku. It was started by the Nobel brothers and others in the 1890s. They're still pumping oil out of these fields. Uh, they've been pumping for a long time, and some of it just kind of lays on the ground. It's uh, an environmental problem, to say the least. This is an area that's been reclaimed by the government. The argument is that the government is cleaning up, using all this oil money to clean up this environmental problem of, of the oil fields. And so they've gone through and cleaned up the ground. You don't see any more seeping oil. And then these little stakes all have little trees attached to them. And supposedly these trees are going to start to grow. Well, it's very hot and very dry in Baku. There doesn't appear to be any... Uh, method of getting water to these baby trees, so I'm not really hopeful these baby trees are going to grow. I, I've also heard from a number of different people that all the government really did was bring in mounds and mounds of dirt and put it on top of the oil, so eventually it will probably seep back through, uh, but that's unclear. This is uh, the Maiden's Tower in downtown Baku. It's part of the old city of Baku, which is an absolutely gorgeous place. Really beautiful, old, medieval kind of walled town in the middle of Baku, and this is uh, one of the sites. There's all kinds of stories about why this is called the Maiden's Tower. You know, some maiden whose heart was broken leaped off of it and gave, committed suicide, those kinds of things. But they just remodeled the whole downtown area because the UN Development Commission a couple of years ago said that Baku, that the Azeris were not taking care of their cultural treasures and were going to unlist them from many of the lists they have of really important historic sites because they weren't cared for. And so the Azeris put a lot of oil money into revamping this revamping the promenade along the Caspian Sea. This is all brand new. It was opened in July of this year. Right? And you can see they've, the, the downtown area has been made into a pedestrian mall, absolutely gorgeous and brand new. This is all because of the oil money. This is uh, kind of a, I mentioned the revolting index and the inequality between the rich and the poor. This is uh, about a couple of hours outside of Baku. This is the house next door to the foreign minister's house. Uh, that they have out in the country. So this is how the elite live, and this is how the average Aziri lives. And it gives you an idea of, of the disparity between the, the, the rich and the poor. Right? Everywhere you go, you are greeted by the fearless leader. Uh, the Ali of Senior's pictures are, are everywhere. He has these wonderful pithy sayings about your region, about Azerbaijan as a whole, about how what wonderful citizens you should be, uh, and so he, he reminds you all the time of your duty. Uh, and in most offices and most hotels, you get a picture of father and son. Right? This is not something, I mean, you, you go to a military base in the United States and they're going to have a picture of the commander in chief. But it tends to be relatively small and it tends to be you know, in the commanding officer's area, not everywhere. Uh, these portraits are a little ubiquitous or a little bit everywhere uh, to, to really be a true, true democracy in, in my view. Right? So I promised you we'd talk a little bit about Nagorno-Karabakh. I know there's a lot we're kind of going through relatively quickly, and I'm happy to clarify anything in the question and answer session. So as the Soviet Union is collapsing, so 1987, 88, 89, uh, this becomes a big issue again. And it's been an issue since the early 20th century uh, because you have this enclave called Nagorno-Karabakh, which the Armenians refer to as Artsakh, that is about 75% Armenian, but it's answering officially to the, poli to the, to the um, political rulers in Baku and Azerbaijan. Well, when the Soviet Union was strong, this didn't really matter, right? Because really the only thing that mattered in the Soviet Union was Moscow. Well, once Moscow got a little weaker under Gorbachev, and we had Glasnost and Perestroika, we had some um, movement at, at both economically, politically, socially, in terms of a little more freedom, uh, a little lighter lid on, on everything, this started to blow up. Right? Uh, in some ways, this kind of stems out of Gorbachev's anti-alcohol policy. When Gorbachev came to power in 1985, one of the things that he had to contend with was the very poor work ethic in the Soviet Union. Right? So Gorbachev comes to power, is trying to figure out why, why is it that the Soviet Union isn't doing what they should, because he's a true believer in socialism. This ought to work. He finally comes up with the idea that, OK, we need to ask people to work harder. So he creates this policy called acceleration. He exhorts everyone to work harder for the motherland. Well, that doesn't work. Right? So he says, OK, well, the real problem is everybody's always drunk. And when you were in the Soviet Union, everything that you bought had a ticket on, a little sticky ticket. And in the corner, it told you what day of the week you, it was made, and, and it told you what time of the month it was made, and there was some other information there, too. And anybody would tell you, never buy anything made on a Friday, 
anything made on a Monday or anything made at the end of the month, right? Because on Monday they're hungover, on Friday they're already drunk, and at the end of the month they're trying to make their quota so they don't do a very good job. So you want to avoid buying things at that time. So Gorbachev decides, okay, what we need to do is reduce the impact of liquor in our society, right? So he says, all right, so we're going to have this anti-alcohol policy. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to limit the sale of alcohol, right? We're going to limit the sale of alcohol to one liter of vodka per day per person in your family. <laughs> well, the average Russian family or Soviet family had three people in it, mother, cut kid, and, and father. The mothers and the kids don't drink, so that meant the guy was limited to three liters of alcohol a day. And this was a hardship, right? Well, this didn't work. Productivity did not go up. So he says, okay, we're going to limit the hours that it's available for sale. We're going to shorten the hours of liquor stores. We're going to um, really, really crack down on drinking and on all the bad behaviors. We're going to throw people in drunk tanks and things. It'll be great. Everybody will be sober and everything will be wonderful and we can you know, turn on our merry socialist way. Well, this doesn't work either because what happens is everybody decides, okay, if I can't buy it, I'll make it. Right? So you need to make liquor, right? You need some kind of thing to make liquor out of. You can make it out of potatoes, a staple of the Russian diet. You can make it out of wheat, a bread, another staple of the Russian diet. So all of a sudden you can't find bread and you can't find potatoes. And then you need sugar to catalyze the process. All of a sudden sugar's gone. <laughs> right? So you have this policy to create more productivity. What it does is it creates shortages in very important foodstuffs. Another thing that Gorbachev didn't take into account was the fact that uh, most of the revenues that were supporting the Soviet state, the domestic revenues, came from taxes on alcohol. So all of a sudden you had a budgetary problem as well. So there were all these kinds of problems. But Nagorno-Karabakh at the time was primarily an agricultural region, and still is. They grow a lot of hops for beer, and they grow a lot of um, wine grapes and, and brandy grapes, right? So as the anti-alcohol policy catches steam, they start destroying the fields. Pretty soon, the Armenians who live in Nagorno-Karabakh are thrown out of work. They can't work because there are no fields to tend. They can't sell their product, even in the Soviet kind of plan system, because there's no product to be, to be gotten rid of, right? And so they, go, they get in distress. They call Moscow and they go, what have you done to us? You're killing us. And Moscow says, huh, you're in Azerbaijan. You're in the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic called Baku. All of a sudden, it's ethnic, right? And it kind of spirals out of control from there and becomes a full-fledged war in which several tens of thousands of people died. Uh, Armenia, a much smaller place, beat Azerbaijan, a much larger place, and currently controls a good chunk of, Arme of what, 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 is, what should be or what legally is Azerbaijani territory. And that's this kind of gold region. So Nagorno-Karabakh is the brown. The gold is occupied territory that the world community says is Azerbaijani, but is currently controlled by the Armenian forces. All right, and these borders have not changed since 1994. There is a line of control. As a matter of fact, most recently, I mean, one of the things I've learned in my travels over the years is that a ceasefire does not mean they stop shooting. I wasn't aware of this before I started traveling to war zones. I kind of thought a ceasefire meant everybody stopped shooting. Turns out that's not really true. The shooting tends to be more sporadic, but it still exists. And so in this region, just in the last couple of weeks, there have been a number of sniper attacks. There have been a, a number of kind of um, volleys across in which a number of people have died. So there is still some conflict on the border. It's, it's in ceasefire, it is relatively stable, but there is still worry uh, that it could ignite again. Uh, but this conflict was primarily over self-determination. Right? A lot of these ethnic conflicts, we could really go back and blame Wilson. Right? Woodrow Wilson, the only, by the way, PhD in political science ever to be president of the United States. Maybe you shouldn't let us make the decisions. Uh, but you know, his idea of self-determination, of the 14 points, all of those kinds of very important and very compelling political ideas have a lot of resonance in places like this. But because people don't live in ethnically homogenous communities, uh, in places where there isn't good governance, you can end up with war. All right, last on to Georgia. Uh, Georgia is not called Georgia. That's something that we do to them. That's not their name. Their name is Sakartviela. 
uh, which means land of the Cartley, which is what they call themselves. Georgia comes out of the, Brit when the British first went to Georgia in the 1800s. Uh, they saw St. George the Dragon Slayer, who they recognized. It's one of the emblems of Georgia. It's also one of the emblems of England. Uh, and they decided they couldn't pronounce this, so they would just call them Georgia, and it's kind of stuck since then. This is the mother of Georgia who greets you when you arrive in Tbilisi. She's up on a hill. She has a sword to greet her enemies and a glass of wine to greet her friends. This kind of encapsulates Georgian culture uh, for, for me, anyway. Right? So there's a map of Georgia, uh, and you can see the more, more differences here than were portrayed on that other map. You've got communities of Osets, which were a group in the, in the north that have had also fought a war at the same time uh, as Nagorno-Karabakh. The Abkhaz, who were over here, and most of you have probably heard of this because in 2008, Russia and Georgia were at war with each other. And so South Ossetia and Abkhazia kind of made it into the American lexicon, so we kind of know where those are now. But you also have communities of, of Armenians down in the south near the Armenian border and communities of Azeris down on the, on the Azerbaijani border. Right? So you have uh, quite a bit of, of ethnic difference here. The government of Georgia is very similar in many ways to the governments of the other two Caucasus states. Despite American government protestations to the contrary, Georgia is not really much of a democracy. I, I love Georgia. I love going there. It's a beautiful place. The Georgian people are absolutely wonderful, very hospitable, really, really wonderful people, but their government is not very responsive. Uh, if you are not with the government, you are against them. This idea of a loyal opposition has yet to really take root. So despite the fact that uh, Mikhail Saakashvili is president, and people like to make a big deal out of the fact that he allegedly went to Columbia Law. Well, he did, but he went for a very short amount of time. And I don't know how many of you dealt with international students when you were in college, or those of you who are still in college, how often you interact with foreign students. My experience has been often these foreign students come here, they engage with other foreign students, and they leave without forming a really lasting attachment to most Americans. Some of them leave without ever viewing the inside of an American home which in their countries would never happen because their version of hospitality is much different than ours. We're very individualistic. We have a tendency to think, oh, if they really wanted to come see my house, they'd ask, right? Well, they won't. And, and so, you know, Saakashvili was here for a very short period of time, a year, year and a half. How much interaction do you really have? How Americanized do you really become at a place like Columbia in a very short period of time? I'm not convinced this makes him Western. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. His party is called the National Movement Party. The current flag of Georgia is the flag of his political party. Historically, that might have some, some analogies, right? This party dominates political life in Georgia. Uh, Saakashvili talks a good game. He seems to want to be democratic. He wants to be definitely be a very close friend of the United States, and he is a close friend of the United States. Uh, they've, both they and Azerbaijan have contributed troops to, to Iraq and Afghanistan. Not large numbers, but they're small countries, right? But uh, there are some limitations, much like with the other two countries. Although if you put them on a continuum of democracy is all the way over here and true authoritarianism is all the way over here, Georgia would be the farthest towards democracy of these three countries. They do have parties. Technically, it's a multi-party system, but these parties tend to be, again, surrounding a personality as opposed to a platform or an ideology. Uh, there have been a number of anti-government clashes since the war in 2008 and preceding the war in 2008, uh, and it's, it's been um, a contentious period in Georgian politics. This is Saakashvili, the president. Behind him is the party, party flag, now the flag of Georgia. Uh, this ought to bring up images in your mind if you know much medieval history, right? This is the sign of the Crusades, isn't it? Uh, very much, Georgia is very much into being, again, like Armenia, a Christian outpost in this primarily Islamic part of the world. Uh, and they take this very seriously, and their flag really is from the 12th century, uh, and it really was one of the flags uh, that, that different groups, or similar to many of the flags that different groups uh, in the Crusades used. Right? He's very interesting to watch. On YouTube, you can actually look him up and, and watch. Even if you don't speak Georgian, you kind of get a feel for the man's personality. He's very vibrant. He's very exciting to listen to speak. He's very charismatic. Uh, and even if you don't really understand what he's saying, you get kind of a flavor for his personality. Um, he's very passionate and excitable. 
Uh, he wants to, when he came to power, he wanted to regather Georgian land, so he wanted to get South Ossetia, at that time Ajara and, and Abkhazia, back under Georgian rule. The territory is sacred to the Georgians. They don't want to give up an inch of it. It's a very small country. They don't want to give up any of it. Uh, so um, that was a problem. Another thing they point to with Saakashvili for his Western credentials is that he's married to a Dutch woman. His name is Sandra Roloffs. You know, okay, that's nice, but I'm not, I'm not sure that really gives him uh, the credentials to kind of outweigh the fact that for the first 30 some years of his life he lived in the Soviet Union uh, and then under a series of not particularly democratic Georgian leaders afterwards. So I'm just not convinced he's truly all that democratic. Um, Georgia is an Orthodox country, so they are, the Georgian Orthodox Church is the dominant religion in Georgia. They always point to the fact that in downtown Tbilisi there's a mosque, in downtown Tbilisi there's a synagogue, in downtown Tbilisi you'll often see uh, different like Hare Krishna groups and things walking through town. They like to think of themselves as very religiously tolerant, and they are, but the dominant religion is, is orthodoxy. Uh, they're conflicted in terms of whether they want to be European or Asian. Most Georgians today will tell you they are definitely a part of Europe. They fly the European Union flag outside of their parliament building on a daily basis. Uh, this is very important to them. So right now they're leaning towards Europe. In other periods in the past, they've leaned towards, towards Asia. Uh, they do have a small border with Chechnya. This caused problems probably five or six or seven years ago. If you heard about the Pankisi Gorge, that was something that was really in the American media for a while. This little tiny border, they, they supposedly there were Chechen rebels coming across and the Georgian government was ostensibly supporting them. Um, Russia has often taken a, a very active interest in the Caucasus countries. This is their backyard. They see it as their sphere of influence. In many ways, that was an excuse for Russia to intervene, which they have, of course, since done. Um, they have these ongoing problems in these separatist regions, which we'll come back to in just a minute, and then the 2008 war with Russia. And I'm going to talk about those a little more when we talk about the problems in the region and the U.S. interests. So this is downtown Tbilisi. This is looking up the hill. This church has an interesting legend. Uh, and that is, this is the Church of St. Nicholas. And uh, it was not there 15, 20 years ago. A group of people, two men, who had prospered a lot from the transition, uh, felt the need to do penance, and so they built this church. All right, this is just downtown Tbilisi. There's lots of beautiful buildings. I like this one because it's pink. This is on Chavchavadze Street. I just think it's a cool building. Uh, a standard residential street. Downtown Tbilisi, right across from the Opera House. That's the opera house. It's going towards uh, Javari, which is a monastery 25 miles or so outside of Tbilisi. And this is, this is a major tourist attraction, and this is the road to get to it. And you're almost always behind cows. Uh, this is another church. They, they claim the Georgian Orthodox Church was established in 337, so they were the second country. Again, countries really didn't exist back then, but they claim it uh, to, to adopt Christianity as a whole. And these are, are just some... Georgians dressed up in national costume standing by the side of the road. And this is uh, Ushguli and Svanetia, which is way up in the mountains. So Abkhazia is out towards the Black Sea. This is kind of the next region in. Uh, if you look at these towers, you also have these towers in Chechnya, but they both claim to be indigenous. There's a little kind of hole at the top of the tower. That's the winter door. So it gives you an idea of how much snow they get in the winter. All right, so the conflicts in Georgia. The two main ones are South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Each of these are areas that under the Soviet Union had some form of autonomy within the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic, so we can blame some of this, I guess, on Stalin. Uh, they're very small. There's 80,000 roughly South Ossetians in the 1989 census and, and roughly half a million Abkhaz, right? So these are very small groups out of the 5.5 million who live in Georgia. Ossetia was about 66% Oset, mm, some Russians, and then about 30, 29, 30% Georgians in the 1989 census. The reason I'm using data that old is because we don't have reliable current data. And this is the time really when the conflict started. Religiously very mixed, Osets are a mixture of Christianity, Islam, and, and kind of other kinds of, of more localized religions. Uh, the Abkhaz had re been reduced to about 17% of the population by the time the Soviet Union collapsed. So they were a minority in the area that was named after them. This is never a recipe for 
for positive things to, to happen. So they feel like they have been marginalized and they have ethnically cleansed the Georgians mostly out of Abkhazia uh, during the war process of from roughly 1991 through to, uh, to 94. And these have been in stalemate until the, the uh, Russian invasion in 2008. So this gives you an idea again of where they are. So you've got the Abkhazia up here with the purple stripes and Ossetia there with the yellow stripes. Give an idea for the neighborhood. All right, U.S. interests in the region. We're going to kind of motor through the end because, as usual, I've talked too much. Um, one of the main interests we have is energy, right? Uh, when, when George W. Bush was president, one of his kind of major platforms prior to 9-11 was energy diversification, energy independence. And this is still around as an idea. Uh, quite frankly, we can't be energy independent, but they seem to like to talk about it. Uh, so the idea of bringing that Caspian oil online and bringing it in uh, to the world kind of oil pool was a way of, of reducing the, the power of OPEC in particular, because this is non-OPEC oil, right? So this was an American interest, was to support the Caspian Basin, to support the oil uh, investigations there, and to help build the pipeline so that they could get this oil out of this very bad neighborhood and into world markets. Uh, in addition, our, one of our interests in the region is the, the role that these countries play in what used to be called the Global War on Terror, or GWAT, uh, which we're now not calling that anymore, but I still like the acronym. Uh, they, they assist in Iraq. There's just something magical about saying GWAT. I just, I just like it. Um, you know, the, the, sim, the, the assistance is not huge on the part of Georgia and Azerbaijan, but particularly Azerbaijani assistance in Iraq is incredibly important because it is a Muslim partner of the Coalition of the Willing. So it makes it seem less like Christians against Muslims and more uh, gives it a little more symbolic importance there. Uh, the 2008 Russo-Georgian War and then the impact of, of a resurgent Russia. And we're going to come back and talk about each of those things. So energy. This is an important transport corridor for this one billion barrels a, a, a day of oil that come out of Azerbaijan. It's a drop in the bucket in terms of international oil supplies, but it's important uh, symbolically perhaps more than anything else. This is part of a Western strategy to diversify oil and gas resources. Uh, now that we've had new discoveries in Brazil and in several other places, this is becoming less important. But it's still on, on European and American radar as important that Azeri gas makes it to market and does not go through Russia. Because if, if Russia controls it, that Russia could potentially turn off the taps as they have with natural gas several times to Europe in the last three or four years. So this is about 1% of world oil needs, right? It's really difficult. I've been working on a book on oil politics in Russia and Azerbaijan for the last couple of years uh, and, am, and am not finished by a long stretch. But one of the many things that I've learned about oil and gas is it's really difficult to determine what the word reserves means, right? Uh, different people estimate a different amount of reserves. And in Azerbaijan, the, 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 the non-government idea is that if reserves have not already peaked, production has not already peaked in Azerbaijan, it's going to peak by 2014, and then it's going to start going down. The Azeri government, of course, says no. And BP, which is one of the big players in Azeri oil, says no. So it's really kind of hard to know. But most independent oil kinds of groups are saying that it's, it's, if it hasn't already peaked, it's going to peak within the next couple of years, and then it's going to start to go down. So this is a short-term asset for the Azeris and probably a short-term interest of ours because it will go away and then we won't have that as an interest any longer. Uh, the terrorism issue, right, terrorism in wars, this is a crucial air corridor for supplying Afghanistan and for supplying Iraq. Uh, this is a, a group that have sent troops, uh, granted small, uh, 46 from Armenia, 150 from Azerbaijan, and 2,400 from Georgia, many of whom were airlifted back in 2008 when, when the, the, the Russo-Georgian War occurred. Um, Georgia and Azerbaijan in particular have been very active and very vocal supporters of the American government, both under Bush and under Obama. As a matter of fact, in Georgia, the road out to the airport is George W. Bush Avenue. They've named it after him because they really, really liked Mr. Bush. Um, Georgia has been actively trying to join NATO and the European Union, and that's some of the reason if you look at the timing of the 2008 war, it came shortly after a NATO meeting in Romania at which membership action plans were discussed for Georgia and for Ukraine. 
Uh, so that's been an issue. And then Azerbaijan has, on a couple of occasions, actively offered basing rights to the United States and to NATO. Come have a base in our country. Wouldn't this be great? Uh, at least in part because they, they feel threatened uh, in, in the area that they're in now. Uh, this is just a map of some of the pipelines. It shows you Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan going out through Turkey. So the regional powers, right? These are important because these are the routes out of and into the region. This is a very isolated region of the world. Uh, Russia considers itself a sphere of influence. We'll talk more about Russia than we do about the others in, in uh, the interests of time. Iran, the two major issues are the co-ethnics with Azerbaijan. The northern part of Iran is primarily Azeri. There are more Azerbaijani ethnic people living in Iran than there are in Azerbaijan. Rafsanjani, actually a former president of, of Iran, was uh, Azeri by, by ethnicity. So they have that problem uh, between them because Azerbaijan, being independent, might make the Azeris in Iran think that perhaps they can leave the, the Persians, and they would not like that very much. Uh, relations with Russia are important. Russia is a big supporter of Iran. They're building a couple of nuclear plants in Iran. Uh, they, they provide a lot of the technology and a lot of the weaponry that Iran has, so they're important. Turkey, there are cultural affinities uh, with Azerbaijan in particular, and historical rivalries with Armenia, and to a lesser extent with Georgia, and, and then of course with Russia. Uh, so Russia. Things we have to look at here are the 2008 war in South Ossetia that spread to Abkhazia. Right? We also have to look at leadership change and what that did for kind of making for this resurgent Russia, uh, the competition for power in the region, and then oil and oil revenues, because that feeds into their power. Right? So this is a map of uh, the conflict in, in Ossetia. And you'll notice there's a lot of these kind of little fire-looking icons in there. Those are uh, airplane bombardment by Russian forces in Georgia. Right? And this doesn't show all of them, although well, you can see the ones down in Tbilisi. Uh, so you can see that it went outside of the main areas of conflict. Right? And we can talk some in the question and answer period about kind of how that conflict started and, and where it went. But in the interest of time, uh, we won't do that right now. Why is Russia resurgent? Well, in part, a change of leadership. We went from kind of old and drunk and not very healthy to you know, Mr. Buff over here, who's always posing half naked on his vacations every year. Uh, you know, Google sexy Putin sometime. You get all these really wild YouTube videos about how sexy Mr. Putin is. He likes his image of being a very dynamic, powerful, healthy, younger man. And this is very much juxtaposed with the aged and infirm Mr. Yeltsin in his last few years. Okay? Russia is in a period of dual power. We, we're coming on another election here next year. Uh, will Dmitry Medvedev or Vladimir Putin run? Will I mean, whoever runs will win. That's the way of, of Russian politics. They have to decide who's going to, who's going to win uh, and who's going to run. And most recently, they had a, a blow up over the Libya thing. Medvedev appears to be supportive of US efforts to create a no-fly zone, US and allied efforts. Putin is very opposed. So there's going to be some interesting stuff going on there between Putin and Medvedev. Uh, international competition, right? Russia wants respect. Russia, when it was the Soviet Union, was a great power. They want to continue to be conceived of as a great power. They want the respect that comes with membership in the G8 and the G20. They, they're on the UN Security Council. They have nuclear weapons. They want to be treated with respect. For a very long time after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were not treated with respect. And so it was Mr. Putin's kind of goal in life to regain the respect of the international community and to be treated as the, the large power that they see themselves as. And so this has been very, very important. Uh, NATO expansion they saw as not only disrespectful but threatening. And we can talk some about that in the, in the question and answer period. Uh, the US wars in Afghanistan and Iraq they see as very threatening. They see this as being encircled. And if you think back to the Marxist concept of capitalist encirclement, we aren't all that far from that in, in, in Russia, at least in terms of the way they think about things. Uh, the criticisms of human rights, particularly in Chechnya, which have been muted of late, but they have existed, have been problematic. Uh, Putin, in particular, got very upset at the behavior of non-governmental organizations, that there were all these democracy promotion kinds of groups running around. And the Peace Corps was treating Russia like it was a third world country, which it does not see itself as. And so these kinds of things they saw as, as a lack of respect. 
All right, and that's, that's important to, to recognize. They also think that when America sends election monitors or the West sends election monitors, that's, that's disrespectful, right? Much like when they offered at our last presidential election to send us election monitors, we didn't think too strongly about that either, right? So why is Russia so resurgent? Why are they causing problems? Why do they invade South Ossetia to kind of teach Georgia and particularly the United States a lesson? And they do this at least in part because their, their economy is driven very much by the price of oil. Right, very much by the price of oil. This shows you a graph of the oil prices between uh, 2005 and 2010. You can see that very big spike? That was the month before the invasion. That was July 2008. Right? If you look at Russian GDP since the fall of the Soviet Union, it's been a steady climb as oil prices have gone up. Okay? Because oil accounts for about 40% of Russia's budget, and energy exports account for about 65% of exports. So very heavily reliant on oil and gas exports for their, for their budget. If the budget, this year the budget was created on basis of $75 a barrel. When I checked this morning, it was $104 a barrel for West, Te West Texas Intermediate and probably a couple dollars higher than that for Brent crude. So they're making really good money at the moment with this. Below $90, the Russian budget goes into the red, meaning they run deficits. So they, they export eight to nine billion barrels a day of crude oil. It's a lot of oil. So for every one dollar increase in the price of a barrel of oil, the Russian government gets nine billion dollars a day. That's a lot of revenue, right? And currently, there's, it's selling at about thirty dollars more a barrel than the Russian government is budgeted for, and so right now they're very flush as they were very flush in, in early to mid-2008, right? So this is, this is an important kind of clue into their, into their behavior. And this is one of the things I'm looking at in my book is the relationship between the price of oil and the behavior of, of the Russian government in particular, right? So a summary, uh, you've got a diverse region with multiple unresolved conflicts, in particular Karabakh, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia. You've got growing inequality and economic issues in the region. You've got weak governance and corruption, and you've got a Russia that strongly considers the region under its sphere of influence, and its ability to protect, project power is strongly correlated with the price of oil, which means we can see a, a bolder Russia if the, if the oil prices remain high. Right? So I ran quite over, but questions? <laughs> Ah, oh, there are people out there. Hello, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, traditionally, with revolutions, following them, you have like a resurgence kind of in democracy, where there's going to be more uh, civil participation. Um, and as you said, in the case of Georgia, which is where I want to apply this, mm -hmm. um, they came out of the Rose Revolution. Right. And yet we still see all of these conflicts with South Ossetia and with Abkhazia. I was wondering if you could comment on why we haven't seen that uh, resurgency. Well, I, I think I would question your premise to begin with. Um, if you look at the French Revolution, you didn't get a whole lot of participation and pleasantness out of the French Revolution, for example. Um, but if, if you want to look at the Rose Revolution and why it didn't solve the problems of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, a lot of it has to do with the way the Georgian body politic works. Right? Uh, in, in 1989, uh, a guy named Zviad Gamsakhurdia comes to power. And he remains in power through the first six months of independence, or up to really early 1992. And he was running around talking about Georgia for the Georgians, and if you're not Orthodox, you're not truly Georgian. And he made these minorities feel very unwelcome. And, and he, they, they really, there were some discussions about Gamsakhurdia being fascist and being you know, so nationalist that he goes over in, into fascism, right? And so all of a sudden when the Rose Revolution comes by, South Ossetia and Abkhazia are supposed to say, oh, well now the Georgians don't feel this way anymore. There's a new leader and now we can all be friends. Doesn't work that way. This is a, a, a place where the, the loyalties and the interests last a long time. Uh, so the Georgians still to some degree are considered by both the Ossets and the Abkhaz as bordering on fascist, as, as wanting Georgia to be Georgian and they're willing to tolerate us as long as we're quiet. But if we make any noise or we want any rights, they're gonna stomp on us. And they really feel that way. And I think that's, does that, does that get at 
what you were looking for. So it's the, the antagonism between the ethnic groups uh, more than anything else. And the Rose Revolution just didn't fix that. It wasn't big enough to fix it. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, even without your summary, I, when I looked at the maps geographically, mm -hmm. when I see the economic statistics, when I hear you talk about the ethnic diversity, I'm wondering if you're optimistic that these countries can t continue as independent entities for any length of time, or if they will eventually be subsumed into a more resurgent Russia, or uh, Iran will extend its influence so that they really won't even be functioning independent even anymore. Well, I, I don't think we have to worry a whole lot about Iran. Uh, Iran is um, consumed with their own issues, shall we say. Something like 65% of the Iranian population is under the age of 15. They don't have time to worry about Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan. They really don't. They're going to have their own problems very, very soon. Uh, so that's, you know, they're kind of, I would not worry too much about them. The Russians feel very strongly this is their sphere of influence. They feel very strongly that they have a right and a duty to intervene in this area. Much as the United States has uh, from the Monroe Doctrine on, at least in Latin America. Right? This has been something that great powers have taken upon themselves to, to have this power. If you can project it, realism tells us you should, right? <laughs> that that's normal behavior for a state. And I, I, I don't see Russia backing off anytime soon, but I mean, what really happened with the 2008 war to a large degree, this was not really so much a war about South Ossetia and Abkhazia. This was a war about Russia sending us in particular and lesser Europe a message that we had created a very close ally with Mr. Saakashvili. We, the, the personal friendships between leaders, John McCain and Saakashvili. As a matter of fact, when, when um, Saakashvili became aware that there were Russians in South Ossetia that had come, they were coming across the border in, in, two, in August of 2008, one of the first people he called was John McCain, right, who at that time was running for president. Right? So he calls a presidential candidate and gets him immediately. Right? This is, um, we were very, very close to the Georgians, and the Russians saw that as threatening. The Russians saw what happened coming out of the Romanian NATO summit as threatening. There was what the West seemed to think was a brilliant maneuver of saying, okay, we're not gonna give you a membership action plan now because Russia would see that as threatening, but we're gonna promise you're gonna be a member someday. The Russians saw that just as threatening as they would see a map. And so this was more about reminding the West that this is their backyard. And much like we didn't want missiles in Cuba 90 miles off of our border, they don't want us in their backyard. Does that get at some of your, some of your question? Yeah. I mean, I, I think they're going to remain independent, uh, at least ostensibly. I think the Russians are going to continue to meddle. Uh, I think that um, we're going to see continuation of these states of what, what Ned Walker called no peace, no war, where there are these stalemates. Uh, that really you can't fix. And some of that is because this benefits certain people, right? If you have an area that's not recognized internationally, that means there's no taxes, that means there's no laws, that means there's no rules. All kinds of smuggling happens in South Ossetia. All kinds of smuggling comes out of Abkhazia, Transnistria, and Moldova. Uh, these, are, these are very lawless areas. And so you have a situation in which someone is benefiting from this lawlessness. So there's an incentive to keep them that way Quite often, these are people in the Russian government who are benefiting from this. So I, I think we're going to kind of stay, at least in the near term, where we are now, where Russia meddles, we back off a little bit, but these places remain at least ostensibly independent. Personally, thank you for coming to speak to us today. And um, I have a bit of a historical question. Okay. Uh, you touched briefly on the um, Armenian genocide in 1915 mm -hmm. and kind of a two-part question. Firstly, I know that it took place in like a, in the midst of a heated civil war, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if it was caused by what, uh, caused by some kind of like ethnic conflict or religious conflict. And secondly, um, the discrepancy in the death toll, which is uh, quite large, I was wondering if you could uh, yes. touch on that as well. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. Count, counting, counting up body counts is really problematic, right? I, I have a 12-year-old daughter uh, who just finished a report on D-Day. And she was very, very upset because she could not find accurate statistics on how many Americans and Germans and Canadians and British died on D-Day. 
Well, given the chaos, it's really hard to stop and count, right? So we don't have accurate counts for D-Day. We, just like we don't have accurate counts for uh, the Armenian Genocide. Generally, the people who want to minimize it use the smaller end of the spectrum, the 300 to 500,000, and the ones who want to inflate it go up to the one and a half million. And because the Turks haven't opened their archives, you know, there's not as much information as we might like. Uh, but it's always difficult in these chaotic situations to get an exact count of, of how many people died or how many people. Some people get lost, some people emigrate but don't tell anybody they left. There's all kinds of things about that. But the numbers are very political. Right? And everyone's trying to gain advantage from that. The people who are saying 1.5 million want to inflate it, and the people who are saying 300,000 want to diminish it, although I think 300,000 is pretty big too. Right? But the, the term genocide has become kind of a political hot potato of, you know, if you don't call it a genocide, the Armenians claim that you know, you're on the side of the people who commit genocide. You're as bad as the, you know, the Rwandan government back in 1994. Uh, and that's not really a fair comparison, but they, they say it. Um, and it, it's just, it's such an important part of, of the Armenian uh, political consciousness, right, that they feel victimized in, in their own territory, and they feel surrounded by danger. And that leads them to find this, that people who reject the idea that it's genocide, they would see the same way uh, a lot of people would see Holocaust denial, that you're minimizing what happened to my people, right? And yes, it did happen historically in a time of great crisis. The Young Turks were rising. You were, Ataturk was fighting against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was collapsing. Uh, you have uh, the Russians and the Turks had fought several wars in the recent past. If you look at the Balkan Wars of the late 1800s, those had been going on, and so that's context. The Armenians were perceived as close to the Russians, and so the Turks didn't trust them. So there were all kinds of things going on there. Um, so I, I, it's just, wars like this are very, very complicated. You can't get a lot of accurate numbers and people then will inflate them for political purposes. Right? Um, we are recognizing here at State University tonight to Dr. Davis, and we have a question that's been emailed in. So here it is. The foreign minister of Georgia has also stated he hates the term post-Soviet to describe his region and his country. Is this statement meant to gain favor? No, I, I think, I mean, when you think about it, the Soviet Union collapsed between the August coup in 1991 and the day Gorbachev resigned, so Christmas Day, 1991, right? That was a long time ago. My students keep telling me, you know, if they were even born yet, they were toddlers, right? And, and that kind of gives me pause, because I, I remember it vividly. Um, <laughs> dates me. But, you know, 20, 30 years after an event, are you still calling it post something? I mean, I think they're right in that they would like to be part of a, a region that, that has a different name other than their history. But their history is incredibly important to who they are now. A lot of the problems these countries have are related to the fact they used to be part of the Soviet Union. So I think, much as we don't like the term, I think it's an apt term. It's likely to go out of, of vogue. It's kind of going out of vogue now. We're starting to use the term Eurasian a little more, although we're not quite sure what that means. Uh, actually, the, the Middle East Studies Association is glommed onto the Caucasus now. And now, you know, if you're presenting a paper on the Caucasus, you can go to Mesa as an academic conference, which it used to not include this part of the world. Uh, so it, it is, it's a contested zone. It's, it's kind of one of those, if you read, Sam Huntington's Class of Civilizations a number of years ago. This is one of the civilizational kind of uh, areas where different groups are confronting each other. And I mean, if there's one thing Huntington is really good at, it's generating controversy. I don't particularly like that piece, but I, I think for a lot of us, when we see you know, Christianity and Islam right up against each other, we start thinking, oh, I bet there's going to be conflict there. And sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. But to go back to the post-Soviet thing, we don't have anything else to call it. I wish we did, because I don't really like it either. One more question. I had a question. You touched a little bit on the diaspora and how that's affecting the region. I was wondering if you could dive a little deeper into that in, in terms of is there a, a brain drain going on in this region? And if so, what, what role does that have currently 
and how can that be, what are some solutions uh, looking towards the future and how can, how can we solve that? How can we bring about change? I mean, in particular, when you talk about the diaspora, you're primarily talking about Armenia. There are not a whole lot of Azeris abroad, except in, in Iran. Uh, Georgians traditionally have stayed fairly close to home, although there's a fairly large community uh, in France. There's a fairly large community in the United States, but, but very small by comparison with the Armenian diaspora. So we're mainly talking about Armenia. Um, the diaspora is not going to go away. I mean, there are many diasporas in, in the world, right? The Armenians aren't the only ones. Um, but they tend to be very active in, in politics in the states in which they reside. So in this country, the Armenians are very active in the politics, for example, of California, Michigan, Massachusetts, uh, various places with a large number of, of Armenians. Uh, and that's some of the pressure for uh, the, the genocide resolutions comes from those Armenian communities in the United States. And then France has passed one already a number of years ago, like in 2000 and two or three, somewhere in there, they passed a, a, a genocide resolution recognizing it as a genocide. Um, what, was the, what was the second part of your question? What role is it playing right now in how to make Oh, and, and brain drain. Yeah, there's been a very large brain drain in, in Armenia because in Armenia there is not much in the way of, of economy. The economy is not doing very well. I showed you some, some statistics that actually showed it we, we went down 11% last year. This year it's hopefully going to grow by four. Um, but a lot of people who have been able to leave have left. You can go to Russia from Armenia without a visa. Uh, you can come to the United States if your family sponsors you. So a lot of you know, smart, hardworking, working age people have left, and what you have left are rabid nationalists and old people and poor people who can't leave, or young people who can't leave. And that's not good for a body politic. Right, at all, to, to have the best and the brightest leave. This was what Russia was experiencing in the early 1990s. People have since gone back. I, the hope is that if they can get this conflict in some way at least stable enough where it's not always at risk of sparking again, that people will start going home. Uh, they might. If you look at what happened in the Baltic states, when the Baltic economy started to go in, going up, which, and then they joined the EU, large numbers of people who left in the 1930s, they and their families went back. As a matter of fact, a former professor at UCAL Irvine uh, went back and ran for president. And there was a formerly American citizen and a formerly Canadian citizen that had been presidents of Latvia and Lithuania, respectively. Um, a woman who spent her entire life career in, in, in uh, Canada as a professor of psychology, I believe, became president of Latvia, went back. So if you can create an economy and a safe space for them to come back, many of them will. But with the wars, it's difficult. And you know, I, I don't see a solution to that in the near term. Um, I think one of the things we have to see before you'll really get movement under Gona Karabakh is the leaders of both Azerbaijan and Armenia have to start preparing their people for peace as opposed to prompting them for war. Right now, the rhetoric coming out of both administrations is very negative towards the other ethnic group, very much fans the flames of the conflict. And if they all of a sudden decided tomorrow to, to compromise, and came up with some kind of solution for this thing, the people would reject it because they haven't been prepared for that at all. And, and so until we start seeing some, either some grassroots movements for peace or we see some kind of rhetoric coming out of the leadership that, that actually doesn't demonize the other side and pr prepares a kind of a culture where perhaps we could compromise. These people are not uh, the Antichrist or you know, the, the uh, infidel, depending upon your point of view. You know, until that happens, we're not going to see a whole lot of, of, of good stuff happening. So, okay. Thank you.